So the last time that we got together, we began by looking at the 12th chapter of Mark, where, as I've said this, the most significant person in the history of the world opens up the most significant book in the history of the world, and he tells us what the most significant section is from this book. And I think you could say it's a very significant thing for us to take in. And it's all about loving relationships. So I parsed this out over five weeks, and we are looking at relational health and emotional health. And it starts, honestly, with our relationship with God so that we can extend that to other people, including the people that are closest to us, our family. This is how Jesus says it in Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. I think it's really important that we understand something, that God looks at you and he looks at me in four parts. That's how he sees us. He sees us as an emotional being, a spiritual being, a mental being, and a physical being. It doesn't matter whether, you know, we use like books and magazines and and newspapers or uh, the way that most people kind of navigate life today through uh, media, uh, podcasts, television, blogs, what what most people actually are searching for when it comes to getting information is most people are wanting to have some information for self-improvement, whether it's their diet help with their finances, help with relationships, whatever the case may be. Most people, something in their life isn't working. And so they're looking for some advice, some counsel, some instruction to to make a a, a course correction, something that they can change so that their life is going to be better than it currently is. Here's something else. The needs and the longings that every single one of us have, where we go to satisfy those things, where we get our information for those things is critical. So think about anything in your life. You could pick, don't say it out loud, but just anything. I mean, if there was something that you could fix, something that you could adjust in your life, what would it be? Maybe it's something emotional. Maybe it's something financial. Maybe it's parental. Maybe it's marital, vocational, your health. I don't know really what it would be. But the question is, if you're wanting help, where is it that you go to get your help? Well, if you go to a counselor, the counselor is largely going to deal with your heart with your emotional life. And they're going to ask you questions like, well, how are you feeling? If you come to a a pastor like me, I'm going to largely focus on your soul and ask you questions like, well, have you been praying? Are you in God's word? Are you serving? Are Are you giving? I'm going to talk about healthy spiritual practices. You go see a psychiatrist, and they're going to deal largely with your mind. What are you thinking? How are you processing reality? What is the process through which you are making the decisions that you have in front of you? If you go to a doctor, the doctor is going to focus on your physical body and your strength and your wellness and they're going to check your blood pressure. They're going to draw blood and check your labs and they'll look at your breathing and all of those things can be really, really helpful, but they are dealing with the heart the soul, the mind, and the body. 
your strength. They come to Jesus, they ask him, what's the most important thing? And he said, well, have a relationship with God that includes all of your emotional life, all of your spiritual life, all of your mental life, and all of your physical life. One of the reasons that we don't make progress in our walk with God is because most of the time we only deal with kind of part of who we actually are, whether it be our mental health, emotional health, spiritual health, or physical health. It's got to be something that includes the whole person. 2,000 years ago, the God who made you, the God who made me, comes as the Lord Jesus, and he tells us exactly how it is that you and I can experience hope and help and healing, and that is through our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And so it begins, Jesus says, that you and I need to have a loving relationship with God. Whatever you are dealing with, whoever you are dealing with, the first priority in your life needs to be your relationship with God. God loves you, and you love God with your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And, and then you are able to, with that kind of love coming back and forth from God to you, you to God, you are able to put that out to other people in a healthy way. That's how God intended that to go. And those others that you are to love are, are called, Jesus says, your neighbors. This can obviously be people that live near you. It can be people that you work with. It can be people that are, you know, in your extended family and even right in your immediate family. But as we're looking at this, I'm talking about the neighbors being your immediate family. They're your closest neighbors, your closest friends. This coming December, my wife and I will celebrate 33 years of marriage. She is my first neighbor. Our next neighbors are Jonathan and Jacob and their families. And beyond that is my extended family, my mama, my, my in-laws, and all the others. And then it's my church family. You guys are way down on the totem pole. But you need to think of it like a, a ripple in the water and how that goes out. And um, a ripple starts to, to ring out, and that's, that's your, your marriage first, and, and then it's your kids and your other family and your church family and your co-workers and your neighbors around you. And, and that's kind of how it's supposed to be. It's about the people that are orbiting in your life near you. That's exactly who Jesus meant for us. The last time that we met, we looked at love, where it all starts. And today we're going to focus on the heart. Next week, I'm going to focus on our soul. The week after that, our mind, and then our strength. But, but let me say this. The God of the Bible is a relational God. The God of the Bible built you for relationship. The God of the Bible wants to be in a loving relationship with you, just like he does with me. But he doesn't want it to just be an obedient relationship. Of course, he wants us to obey him, but he wants a loving relationship. And he knows that love actually has to precede obedience. This is why Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. The obedience is the product of a loving relationship. God doesn't just want obedience. He wants obedience that actually kind of originates from our heart. I'm a guy that loves technology. I love to get the latest, greatest, whatever it is. This is the Series 9 Apple Watch. You know, I love all the new gadgets and things. I love technology. I love leveraging technology even in the church. I love all of those things. But technology, all it does is it obeys. I love using it, but I don't really have a relationship with it. It is an inanimate thing. It is simply a tool that I use that will obey me when I prompt it. But there's no relationship. It's a thing, not a person. 
Technology obeys me. That's it. And God made you as, an, as a person in his image. He made you as a, a love receiver and a love giver. He made you for loving relationships, and out of those loving relationships can come health for you and health for your family and all of the relationship that you have. So, so what does God have to say about the heart? Well, I want to start today in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. This is a verse that I think is really important. You want to open up your Bibles for this, but I want to use this to, to define and explain the heart. The heart is mentioned roughly 1,000 times in our Bibles. That means this is a very important subject with God. So honestly, I could have picked out probably a thousand different verses. In fact, a really interesting study for you would be go, you know, right in heart in your Bible app and just see how many verses show up. You have about a thousand and just start reading the context of all of those verses. That would be a really enriching study for you. But sometimes when the Bible refers to the heart, it's actually referring to the physical organ inside of our chest cavity. But most of the time, Honestly, most of the time, it's referring to the emotional center of a person. That's the exact way that you and I use the word heart. We, we say, oh, he has a good heart. Or we'll say something like, man, she was heartbroken. We use this language back when the Chicago Bulls were, were really good. We, we would say that Michael Jordan was the heart of the team. We understand this language, that the heart is the emotional center from which data is interpreted and decisions are actually made. Proverbs 4.23 gives us a really great illustration. This is an analogy of the heart. And I want to look at this verse actually in three different translations because I don't want this to just be something that's black and white on a page for you. I really want this to become something that's high def for you. Look at Proverbs 4.23. It says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Now, I just envision in your mind a, a spring bubbling up out of the ground. I grew up in, in Florida, and uh, I spent, I've told you guys this a lot, I spent a lot of time as a youth looking for snakes and turtles in the woods, and right outside of Coco High School off of... Uh, uh, what was that road that ran by Coco High School? Anyways, but anyways, there's a, there's a road, there's some woods back there right across from the high school, and I remember one time with my buddies, Raymond and Arthur, going back in the woods, and we found a spring that flowed into a creek. And the spring, we could just see it. There was like white sands. It was kind of bubbling up in the, in the sands. The water was really cold, and it was clear. I mean, just beautiful, clear water. A lot of times you have a uh, a stream in Florida, it's black and mucky and gross, but this was beautiful, clear water. It was a stream, or a, a spring, and it flowed right into a creek. And this is, this is the thing. The spring is the source, and the, the creek, the, the river, the stream, is actually down away from the source. And so what the Proverbs writer is saying is that the, the life that we live is actually downstream from the source. The source is the heart. Our heart is the spring, and from our heart flows our life. So here, here's, here's the thing. You are the keeper of this whole stream, and oftentimes what happens is behavior is downstream, Behavior is not the first thing. Our heart is actually upstream. And we see the behavior, but we really have a hard time seeing the heart. And God knows our heart. God searches our heart. God examines our heart. But we get frustrated when we see behavior. And we get into behavior modification, but not heart transformation. And so... What the Proverbs writer is saying is, if you don't like how life is flowing downstream, you got to go to the source, to the heart. The heart is the spring. The life is the flow. Look at it from 
uh, the NIV. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Everything, everything flows from the heart. It all flows from the heart. Our emotions, our decisions, our feelings. One more translation, New Living Translation. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Almost sounds like a, a soldier protecting something at all costs, like a life or death scenario, because it is. In your own life, we can just focus on behavior, not the cause. We parent our children. We could just want them to obey us and not focus on the heart condition that's actually behind their behavior. I have, I have counseled many people in my time as a pastor a couple might come in to me and might be having marital issues, and sometimes a couple will come in and they'll say, you know, we just want a divorce, so try to tell us why we should not do this. Then another couple might come in and sit down with me, and, and they'll say, you know, we love each other, but man, we are just driving each other crazy. We, we need to figure this out because we're not navigating it very well. And, and let me tell you something. The heart is the want to. Behavior is how to. The first couple, they don't have any want to. And so it wouldn't matter what I said to them because they, they don't have the want to there. I could try to give them five practical steps every day, all day, and it's not going to matter because how-to isn't going to change the want-to. The other couple has a lot of hope because the want-to is still there. The heart upstream is good. So we can focus actually on the how-to and modify those things. So when it comes to actually parenting or relationships, let me ask you this question. How is your heart. How is your heart with God? Do you have a hard heart or a tender heart? Do you have a bitter heart or a forgiven heart? Do you have a broken heart or a healed heart? How is your heart toward God? When your heart is right toward God, it's actually healed by God's love. And then you're able to ask yourself, well, how is my heart toward my child? How many of you have found, just some of you are past parenting, but how many of you found that your child exposes your heart like no other? I, um, I, have, I have in this uh, Coke Zero because that's always what I have in a styrofoam quick trip cup. But imagine, okay, if I didn't have a lid on this and it's filled to the brim, um, what, what would, what's inside of this is Coke Zero. Imagine if somebody came and, and bumped into me and I, I spilled, some spilled out. What would come out would be Coke Zero because it's the only thing that's inside the container. Coke Zero is in this container. Nothing else is in there. And so, you know, some of you, you might blame somebody else because they, they bumped you. The collision doesn't change the contents. It just exposes what's inside. And you think, you just, you just bumped me. I'm angry. But what comes out of you is already inside of you. It just exposes your heart. And our children expose our hearts. You ever said something to your kid and you're like, I cannot believe I just said that to my child. Out of the overflow of the heart, Jesus says, our mouth speaks. Kids frustrate us. 
They drive us insane at times. As a parent, we call this being awake. And when they do that, they bump us. And what comes out of us is whatever is in us. Some of you, you want your kid to be completely obedient. Don't ever want them to offend me. I don't want them to disappoint me. I want them to do what is expected of them. I don't want them to screw up. I don't want them to make a mistake. I want them to do what they're supposed to do. You want a machine, not a child. And what God is saying is that if you get, if you get your heart right, then whatever you say, whatever you do, the way that you respond will be healthy, and it will help your child, actually, to have a better heart so that they can appreciate being in a loving relationship. But our heart has to come first. It is the parent's heart before Father God, and then the parent's heart toward their child. That has to be primary. So I want to look at a case study on the heart in your English Bible. This is actually the very first time that the word heart appears in our Bibles. It's in Genesis chapter 6. And what I, I, want to, I want to look at this because God is a father. He has a heart as a loving father toward his children. And what we're going to look at in our text, God's children are disobeying him. And God is responding. So what does it look like when, when two hearts are involved, the father's heart and his children? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 says this, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. That is an incredibly indicting statement against mankind. Every thought of his heart was only evil continually. We make excuses for our hearts. God examines our hearts. You don't know my heart. Well, God does. In fact, God knows your heart better than you even know your heart. God searches the heart. He examines the heart. We excuse our hearts God made us for healthy relationship. People have decided that in, in our passage, they don't want that. They don't want a relationship actually with God. They want to live independently of God. And you, you have to hear, sin is where our heart will naturally drift to before our behavior actually manifests. Hearts are far from God, so now behavior is affecting their relationship with God. And if you are a parent, you got to listen. It is going to be important to be able to accurately diagnose the heart condition of your child. Is my kid brokenhearted? Well, God, how do I heal his heart? Is, is my kid hard-hearted? God, how do I soften his heart? Does my child have a, a foolish heart? God, how do I give wisdom to my child? Does my child have a rebellious heart? Well, God, how do I change that heart to make him compliant? God looks at the heart of his children and he says, the heart of my kids is only wicked all the time. So we need to be honest about the condition of our children's hearts. You cannot rightly parent a child until you know the heart condition of your child. How many of you have seen like some crazy news story, some person's like a serial killer, they've murdered a bunch of people, and then they talk to some of their family members and they'll say, I know that they did this, but man, they had a really good heart. No, they didn't. They were horrible. They were wicked. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of the heart, our life is actually lived. 
Some parents don't accept reality when it comes to the heart of their own child, and that's because to really kind of get into their heart of their child scares them. And if you are honest about the condition of your child's heart, then, then you and God can actually work together then. Because here's the good news. God is a God who actually changes hearts. He doesn't leave them stay the way they are. So be honest about where they are and then invite God in to help change the heart of your child. So what about God's heart? That's verse 5 in Genesis 6. Look at verse 6, and it says, And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Not only do we need to be honest about the heart of the child, we need to be honest about our own heart. God here is a father, and he has rebellious, foolish children. And God's heart is broken. God is heart broken. That is exactly the right response, by the way, to rebelliousness, to be heart broken. Right now, God is not violent here. You guys know what happens in this story. He's not angry right here. Right here, he's heart broken. And you know that your heart is in a bad place when your kid's heart is in a bad place. And and your response is something other than just simply being heartbroken. You're angry. You have inconvenienced me. Look at the mess that you've caused. That's not about them. That's not about their relationship with God. That's kind of about you and your own personal comfort. What are people going to think about us? You have destroyed our reputation. Well, that's actually... That's actually not a good heart. That's a proud heart. That's a fear of man heart. <laughs> Heartbroken is I love you. I want you to flourish in your relationship with God. I want you and I to flourish in our relationship together. And what you are doing is it breaks God's heart and it breaks my heart too. Sin is not just the breaking of God's law. Sin, very first, primary, is just breaking God's heart. And if you have had a rebellious or prodigal child, and I have, then you know exactly how this feels. Because the child is choosing death over life. They're choosing folly over wisdom. They're literally choosing Satan over God, and, and that breaks your heart. God is honest about the condition of the hearts of his children. We need to be honest about the condition of our own children's heart. God tells us his heart. We need to be aware of our own hearts, and if our heart is not right, we need to bring our heart to our Father and say, God, you need to help me with my heart. Help me get it right because I can't help my child until you help me with my own heart. How many of you have found that your heart's, your child's heart is, is bad and, and your heart is bad and then there's this collision and it is never, ever good? Because they get angry, you get angry, Everybody's angry, and nothing ever gets fixed. Their heart simply exposes your heart. So bring your heart to God, have him change your heart, and then you are going to be able to bring God to your child's heart, and God will change the heart of your child. And listen, what I'm telling you right now, that is very hard Look at verse 8 in Genesis 6. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And that word favor literally means grace. It means love. It means mercy. And then verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. This is all about relationship. 
God doesn't just want to forgive you. He wants relationship with you. He wants to walk in life with you. He wants to direct your steps to keep you from falling into a trap or getting into harm. Some of you believe in God, but are you walking with God? My boys, Jonathan and Jacob, were little. I would get them out of the car and say, okay, hold daddy's hand. Now I do that with my grandsons. God is a father. And he wants that kind of loving relationship with you. So you look at this story in Genesis 6, and you see that the heart of the people is hard-hearted. The heart of the father is heart-broken. The solution is God coming close to his child and walking with him and directing his steps. And if, you, and if you don't know this, you need to know this. Jesus is actually God's broken heart. Jesus is God the Son coming on behalf of God the Father, seeking a relationship with people who are hard-hearted, and Jesus' heart is filled with nothing but love. And what we do... We see Jesus' loving heart, and that exposes our own hearts and the wickedness in our hearts. And rather than repenting of our wicked heart, we think there's something wrong with his heart, so we kill him. That's how hard our heart is. We crucify Jesus, the perfect loving heart. And what Jesus does on the cross, because he is loving, is he forgives us. He dies on the cross. He pays our debt to God. He literally becomes the ark that delivers us from the consequences of what we deserve and God's justice that he has every right to. And what is amazing is Jesus dies of a broken heart. Spiritually, he cries out these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a spiritual broken heart. His relationship with the Father was severed in that moment when he took my place on the cross and paid the penalty for my sin. Our heart is hard, sinful, and wicked. And God's heart is loving, relational, and kind. Jesus comes as God's heart, and he dies of a broken heart. And I'm telling you this simple truth because you cannot move forward in your relationship with your children or any relationship and get anything right if your heart condition toward God is not right. God needs to forgive. God needs to heal your heart. There's going to be times when you look at your child and say, I do not like where their heart is right now. God says, I know. So you, you need a, a broken heart in the presence of God, and then you bring God's presence to deal with their heart. And some of you, as parents, have never expressed to your children the heartbreak, not in a manipulative way. Uh, my wife is fond of saying this phrase to Jacob, uh, in particular, I birthed you in pain and suffering when she asks him to do something and he doesn't want to do it. So not in a manipulative way, I'm saying in an honest way. I remember once when I was a boy and life was not good at the time. I was getting into things that weren't good, things weren't great. But I remember walking into Grandma's house, and she wasn't in the living room, but her bedroom door was open. And my grandma had her Bible open, and she was saying my name over and over. She was saying things like, Lord, help him. Help Michael. God, just please help Michael. And she was crying with tears coming down her cheeks. And I never said a word. My grandma never knew that I saw her. She never knew that I was standing there watching her do this. But I want you to know that that moment kind of like 
It was like taking a branding iron and it was being seared right onto my soul. My grandma was praying for me. And I know my grandma's heart for me, actually seeing her broken heart for me started to kind of break my heart. Sometimes it's okay to sit down with your kid and just say, I, I, I want what's good for you. I want what's best for you. But right now, my heart is breaking. Remember, God can actually change hearts. There's, there's a great verse. This is from Ezekiel 36, verse 26. This is one you should put to memory. The prophet says, speaking of the Lord, and I will give you a new heart heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I was born in 1970, three years before I was born, 1967, the very first human heart transplant took place. It was a medical massively major breakthrough. This was something huge for science, humanity, for the earth. Since that time in 1967, there have been more than 50,000 heart transplants around the world that have taken place. Think about that. This, this organ in our chest, it's breaking down, it's it's not working properly, it's not pumping correctly, it's not doing its job, and a doctor comes in, makes a cut, opens up the chest, and cuts out a heart, takes it out, puts in another one. That's, that's amazing. God does that to you and I spiritually. And God looks at our spiritual heart, and he says, wow, that thing's broken. That thing, it's, it's cancerous. All that thing is doing is it's, it's just pumping death and destruction, not life, not love, not learning. So he takes out the old heart and he replaces it with a new heart. And here's what I want you to know. You can actually have a, a healthy parent-child relationship, but you won't ever experience that until you have that new heart I'm talking about. And then you can, you can pray that God's going to do the exact same thing over your child. And you know that new heart actually comes from Bible reading and, and prayer and worship and time with God's people in their lives. Before your child's behavior will change, your child's heart needs to change. Some of you keep trying to get an old heart to live a new life. And honestly, only a new heart will allow for a new life. You and your child, both of you, have to have a new heart. The new heart wants a healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with other people. And that's how you know you have a new heart, because you want to read the Bible. You want to get to know God better. You want to be with God's people more. You want to pray to God. Why? Because a new heart actually comes with new desires. The way out of sin and your old life is to feed the deepest desires of your new nature. And it's when the Holy Spirit helps you realize that you can walk in right relationship with God and seeking Him, following Him, loving Him. As I said, I'm coming up on 33 years of marriage with my beautiful bride. And I'm happy to report that for 33 years, I have been faithful to her and she has been faithful to me. But my goal in my marriage is not to just avoid adultery. <laughs> My goal is to be in love with Shannon. And as I am in a loving relationship with her, it simply becomes a natural thing that I'm not going to go commit adultery. And I know people that are faithful to each other, but they hate each other. 
That's what happens when you focus downstream on behavior and not upstream on the relationship. The relationship will actually pull you out of bad behavior. Doesn't mean that you're going to not struggle. Some of you, actually, your, your relationship with God is, is based on fear and punishment. God wants you to be in relationship with him out of love, not out of fear. And when you do blow it, then your heart, it'll be broken. And you can have God's help to pull you forward in the relationship because God wants your heart and he wants you to have your child's heart as well. Because if you have the heart of your child, then all the other stuff, the behavior, the things, the mouth, the attitude, God can work on all of that. If your kid does not have a heart for God, then they don't have a heart for you. And there's nothing that you can do that would ever change that. But I don't want you to say, well, it's hopeless then. Because God actually changes hearts. You don't do that. God does that work. Let's look at Job chapter 1. I want to read to you the first five verses of Job chapter 1. It says this. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes. And they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Be like Job. Go to God on behalf of the heart of your child and tell God, Change my child's heart. He will do that. And listen, if you do that, if that is your regular custom, it actually changes your heart as well. It changes your heart toward your own child. I know so many parents that prophesy doom over their children, prophesy death over their own kids. Tell your child that you want your child to have a heart for God. Tell them that you want God to change them into a man or woman of character. That passage that we read in Ezekiel about God giving a new heart doesn't have some footnote in it about the terrible twos or the teen years where that doesn't apply then. God can change the heart of your child. You've got to talk to God about your child. You can be two years old, a teen or a tween, Get a new heart from God, a heart that is made of flesh with a new spirit. You and I need to be thinking biblically, not culturally. God is the God who made us, and if there is any hope for parenting children, it comes with a new heart, and that new heart comes directly from God. I want you to see this last verse that we'll close out with. Proverbs 20, verse 5. Five says this, the purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. He's giving him the analogy of standing over a well. Ever stood around one of those round wells, looked down deep into the water? You can't see the very bottom of it. So you, you drop a bucket down in there, and you let that bucket go all the way to the bottom, and then you pull that bucket back up. You draw it out. That's the analogy. And what he's saying is that that's exactly like our heart. Our heart is like a deep well. 
And God helps us get, get a bucket to, to get to the bottom of it and draw it out. And one of the most important things that you can do with your child is to help them to, to examine what's inside of their own heart. Be very careful with this because sometimes parents see certain behavior and then they'll just rush in and, and they, they'll judge their heart. They crush their child in the process. You, you've had that happen and, you know, somebody's come up to you and say, I know what you were thinking when you did that. And, and they're way off base and it hurts. Children feel like that a lot, actually. There are four different kinds of, of hearts. We, we all know this one, the bad heart, bad behavior. This is really easy to see. This is the kid that, you know, you put kids in a room and the parents are kind of distracted and this one kid grabs every toy and puts them in a pile and stands in front of it and doesn't share any of the toys with any of the other children. Bad heart, bad behavior. Here's another one, bad heart, good behavior. And this one's sneaky. Remember uh, Little House on the Prairie? Reminds me of Nellie. This is a little harder to see. Because this, these are the children that are well-behaved while everybody's looking. These are kids that have learned, even from a young age, how to manipulate parental authority. They're good when everybody's looking, but when you, when you turn your back, you better watch out. This is the moral child, actually, that ends up going to hell. You can raise a child that does everything right, but they end up in hell because they don't have a heart that has a loving relationship with their heavenly father. The next heart is the good heart, bad behavior. This one's complicated. Imagine a child that wants to wash their dad's car, so they go and get a Brillo pad and get some Comet. Scrub that car clean. Good heart, bad behavior. A dad can come up and say, you know, next time, it's just an idea, but next time, maybe come to daddy and let me help you do that. Because in that moment, you can crush that child by going right to the behavior and getting upset. I remember when, um, when my boys were little, we were with another parent actually, and um, we, were, we were all together, spending part of the day together, and uh, myself and Shannon and this other mom were visiting, and the boys were in the van. We were driving a caravan at the time, and in the van was the other boy of this mom. He had, he had autism, and sometimes he would just get into repetitive behavior that wasn't good or healthy, and, um, and all of a sudden you hear just a kazoo and we're talking, we were distracted and the one kid of the other mom runs up, his nose is bloody and he's screaming, he punched me in the nose and there's blood on his face and, you know, um, and I'm, you know, wondering what's going on and, um, of course he's yelling, you know, that it was my son, Jonathan, that punched him in the face, and now this boy's mom is looking right at me like, what are you going to do about this? So I go investigate, and then I ask Jonathan what happened, and he said, well, I punched him in the nose. I said, why? He said, well, because he kept kicking Jacob in his shin, and he wouldn't stop, and I asked him to stop, but he kept doing it, and Jacob was crying, and he wouldn't stop, so I punched him in the nose. Jacob, at that time, was just a little guy. He was only like three or four at the time. And so um, the mom's wanting to know what I'm going to do, and she actually asked me, well, what are you going to do about this? And I said, well, I'm going to go get Jonathan some ice cream. And, uh, you know, here, here's the reality. Whether you have autism or not, you cannot be a bully. You have no right, no matter what condition or what special need that exists in your life, to put your hands on another person ever, period. And, um, and so my son 
is not going to be the guy that stands aside and lets a violent act occur. My son, even at a young age, was raised to step in and stop somebody else from hurting somebody else. And I, I actually thought that was pretty cool. Um, he's not the guy when some violent thing is occurring, gets his cell phone out, starts re recording. No, that's not my son. My son's the guy that goes and stops whatever's happening. But I, I could say, hey, buddy, I'm really proud that you stopped your, son, your brother from being bullied, but maybe next time come and get dad. Um, so that's good heart, bad behavior. And the last one is this, good heart, good behavior. And you know what? As a mom and a dad, these are the absolute moments that we live for as parents. When your child does something that is beyond the pale, amazing, and it just comes out of their little precious heart, not instigated, not, not manipulated, not anything. It's just because they did it. And, it, and it's sometimes little things. My, my grandson, Ian, uh, we were invited to be chaperones to an event where they went to a nursing home and uh, they sang some songs. We watched them sing. And it was at Easter. This is right before Easter, the week before Easter. And then they had colored papers of uh, the empty tomb with flowers and stuff and whatever. And they colored it and you know how kids color stuff. I mean, my son, my grandson is five, so you just envision what it looks like. But then they were to go give this to somebody there, and my grandson, Ian, I'm not with him. I'm just standing on the side of the wall watching all of this take place. He takes, he takes his paper over to this man that was wearing a World War II veteran's cap, sitting in an electric scooter cart, and he hands him the picture, and then he says, can I hug you? And that man hugged my grandson and just started to weep. And of course, Shannon and I are standing on the side. We're just bawling like, oh, this is so wonderful. Because that's the moment. That's the moment you live for, where you just almost burst with pride because that's an amazing moment of my grandson. Nobody, nobody told him to do that. And you nurture those times because those times become momentum-building occasions for you as a parent. So... Our heart is one of the most important things that we have. And the author of the Proverbs says, guard it with your whole life. Because everything comes out of it. Next, next week, we're going to really deeply examine what it means to have the right kind of spiritual life with your child. So I hope, I hope you'll be here and Tonight, we are missing uh, a few folks because it's Mother's Day event, and my wife stole them from us, but um, that's okay. And I'm recording these. I really want you to come, and, and this is not just parenting material, as I've said. This is for all of us because we all need work in these areas. So let's pray, and we'll close out. Thank you so much, Father, for tonight. Thank you so much for what uh, we have gleaned from your word tonight. God, change our heart. Help our heart to be right with you. Help us, Father, to, to focus on our own heart, Lord. And then not just to focus downstream on behavior with our children, but really, God, to start to, to dive deep into the well of our own child's heart. To draw that out, Father, and help their heart be examined. And then, God, with your spirit and your power to be changed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.